Good. Thanks everybody for coming here. My name is Marcus Miller. I'm the director here at the uh, Gordon Snellgrove Gallery. Just want to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory, homeland of the Métis. And we uh, pay our respects to the First Nations, Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I'm very happy to introduce Rachel Broussard. Rachel is in her second year of uh, the MFA program here. There's some seats uh, right there, so grab a chair and make yourselves comfortable. Uh, so this is the first in a series of four uh, MFA talks that we have, and so they're uh, just they're scheduled every week from now on. Uh, we've got four of them coming up. Uh, Rachel's uh, uh, had her. Uh, is from Texas, which no, is very exotic. Not from You're not from Texas. <laughs> but you did your degree in Austin, Texas, but yeah. you are actually from Louisiana. Yeah. That's what I meant. It's <laughs> <laughs> very important. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, uh, hey, I get it. It's a little tension over that. <laughs> I won't make that mistake again. Rachel has been really active since she's been a student here. Uh, she's shown uh, several times in group shows at the, at, in this uh, venerable uh, venue at uh, Gordon Snellgrove. She's also, uh, she helped organize, I think you were, uh, helped organize the exchange show with the uh, uh, University of Regina. Uh, so she's in the uh, show there, the fifth, fifth parallel. Uh, she was in a show called All Together Now at AKA. Uh, in, uh, in Austin, Texas, she's shown at the St. Edward's Fine Arts Gallery, uh, Pump Project Art Complex, Up Collective, all in Austin. Uh, she's currently the uh, uh, President, Master of Fine Arts Council, and she's uh, been an instructor for drawing here. Uh, I know that she's been a project assistant to several artists, Allison Norlin, um, who else? I've got a few others. Andreas Buchwald and Linda Duvall for her In the Whole project. Ali's project was uh, in uh, Louisiana, New Orleans. Um, uh, she's, uh, uh, she's on the board of directors at Paved Arts. She's a program guide at uh, the Reme right now, so she's doing lots of stuff. And you were also involved with the Saskatchewan Arts Council for a time. So I give you Rachel Brissard. Thank you all for coming and joining me today. So I think I know most of you, so it's, it's really special to be able to share a bit with you about my art practice today. And for those of you who don't know, thanks for coming as well, and I hope I can meet you after the talk. Uh, so you all came to hear about the genetic mutations projects I've been doing with the biology scientists at the U of S, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're here for an artist talk, uh, and that's what I'm giving. So I'm going to be talking about the uh, mutations I've been doing in my studio, but these mutations aren't scientific, uh, they're artistic, and I'm mainly using collage materials. But before I get into my current practice, I just wanted to share with you a little bit more about my background and a little bit about some of the previous artworks I've made. So like Marcus said, after I corrected him, I'm from, <laughs> I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana, which is in South Central Louisiana. And I went to, did my undergrad in Austin, Texas at St. Edward's University. So yes, I am an American, but I'm also Canadian, and I'm very happy to be living in Canada right now. And a large part of my growing up experience was going to see my mother's family in uh, southern Ontario every year. So we do this drive from Louisiana to Ontario. And uh, I think seeing the scenery of middle America passing by through the, the windows of the car made a, a big impact on me and has to do with the artwork I make now. So this is an earlier piece uh, that I completed towards the end of my undergraduate degree and it, it connects well to the current work I do. It's called uh, A Life I Don't Remember. And so the work I was doing in my undergraduate studies was mainly focused on uh, memory and place and personal history. 
So uh, this work was about my relationship to my mother's memories of Ghana, and that's where she met my father. So I felt like I had this like personal connection to this place, even though I'd never been there. Uh, so this is a, a sculpture that's about half a meter or half a meter wide by a meter long, and it's constructed out of book pages from uh, recycled books about Africa, and it has an image of my my mother projected on it, uh, inverted to show that kind of relationship to those memories and how it how it shifted. So I'm still making work from recycled uh, book pages and using uh, used a little bit of projection. So it was interesting to see this connection to the work I'm doing now. Uh, and then this is my thesis work from my undergraduate degree, and it's called Far Away Place. And for this work, I was looking more at my father's family history, and they had a cattle ranch in South Louisiana. And I was interested in uh, seeing how the memory of that place overtook what the place actually is now, which is a non-functioning ranch. And it has the homes of my grandparents there, but no one lives there, and everything is just still in its place and kind of preserved in time. Uh, so I did these interviews with my, my father and his siblings to get a sense of what the history was there, and then collected objects from that branch to bring to Texas for my final show. And I constructed this small room uh, that actually has a curtain. So it became kind of like a small museum or a stage set that the viewer could go into and uh, feel like they were maybe transported in time back to that place. So naturally, when I moved to Saskatchewan, I had to begin working with objects that had less personal significance, because I just moved here with a few suitcases. Um, and I wanted, it was, when I began the MFA program, I knew that I wanted to work with recycled materials. That's pretty much all I knew, because I think it's important that uh, we as artists pay attention to where our materials come from and uh, the environmental impacts they can have. So I, I began accumulating all these used books and magazines. And uh, uh, one of the objects I found in uh, some magazines that I got at a garage sale was this uh, map of Europe from 1969. Uh, so this piece is called Falling Roads. And it has two main elements. There's this, this map of Europe hanging at the front and then a projection of found footage on top of the map. And so the, it began with the inclination to uh, cut, cut all the land out from between the roads, or the main, the main roads on the map. So you can see on the map that uh, the roads have this kind of lace-like pattern now. So like, because of European history, it's a much more densely populated place than North America. So I found like the road systems were really intricately woven across its surface. And then the patterns that the roads began to create once I'd cut them out, I drew a lot of natural associations. Uh, this is a close up. <coughs> so the, you can see the shadow of all the, the roads on the wall because of the projection. So I, I feel like they have associations to things like skeleton leaves and butterfly wings. And the projection that's on the surface of the map is a projection of um, fall leaves in Paris. Uh, because I'm, I was interested in, like, we, we, we mainly stick to, like, our human infrastructures a lot of time, like most of us in urban life. And you're on the highway a lot, or on the sidewalk. And maybe it's, it's hard to get away from these and connect with the places that are in between our infrastructures. And I think it's important that we remember to do that and go for a walk or go for a hike and be reminded of our kind of place in the larger systems of the world. Mm -hmm. 
So you might have seen, like in this image, the map is inverted, and that's because there's the, the back of the map was purely white. So when I started this piece, I just started with the inclination to cut, and I didn't realize it's going to project on it. But once that made a nice projection surface to flip the map around and have the white surface. But it hangs about a foot or two from the wall, so the viewers can still uh, don't play that yet. The viewer can still walk around the map and see the back that has all the the writing and the colors, and maybe see more of the associations to the countries and those boundaries as well. But it's interesting once the uh, once the, the pieces are cut out, the boundaries of all those countries kind of disappear, and you just see more of how we are interconnected. So this is a, a pretty amateur video I took of uh, the piece, just so you could see a bit of how the, the footage plays across the surface. And it's going to be a little uh, confusing because I'm moving the camera as I'm taking the video, but also the footage on the that's projected is a very amateur video, so the guy's moving his camera around. But I'll play it twice and maybe you'll get a handle on what's happening. Oh, if I can play it from here. And the sound is not a component of my project, that was just coming from another piece in the gallery. So I think once uh, once the projection is on the map and the, its fall leaves, there's a real reminder of the changing of the seasons and a reminder of this kind of uh, cyclical power of nature. So speaking of the, uh, the power of nature, <laughs> um, disclaimer, like the next four images aren't my own. But I just wanted to show a few images of my home landscape to kind of give you an idea of where I'm coming from and how that impacts uh, my artistic practice as well. So uh, this image is of uh, the vine kudzu, which is an invasive species in the southern and eastern part of the United States. And it comes originally from Japan. Uh, but it's just completely taken over the landscape and when it comes into a forest it just covers all everything and completely chokes out the trees and any other vegetation that might be there but growing up in the south it's just a ubiquitous part of the landscape so i never questioned it never knew that it was an invasive species and i think that's the case for a lot of people living there too until you learn It's another image of a very beautiful invasive species, Wisteria, and it's originally from China, but it also grows all over in the south. And uh, I'd be very upset when my dad would be burning the roots and <laughs> pulling it out of the forest because it's so beautiful and it smells really nice. But it's, it's similar to kudzu in that it, it can really just devastate and choke out all the life. Even though people use it in their gardens and it's more of an ornamental plant. So my point in showing these images is to illustrate how layered our environments are and how um, you might not always realize what's been there forever or what's, what is new to a place. And I think that our, our idea of place is really built around not only what is present but also what's absent. So, for instance, when I moved here, um, it's really exciting to see this like very dramatic shift in seasons that I've never seen before. But I also felt like I needed to get my eyes checked because the landscape was so devoid of all the browns and greens that I'm used to like seeing all year round. Um, so, yeah, so this is an image of the swamp in Louisiana, the Trafalia Basin. And it's just to show you kind of like there's a real mystery to this landscape and 
you know, we have things like Spanish moss hanging everywhere that creates all these shifting shadows and the water's really murky and the vegetation's really dense, so you don't always know what might be surrounding you. And there's nasty predators like alligators and poisonous snakes and all kinds of critters running around that you're not sure about. Oh, and we also have a very layered like uh, culture there with French and Creole and Spanish, African American influences all blending together. Uh, so, yeah, so similar to how I do a collage practice, I see the place I'm coming from is a very colorful collage as well. And that's an image of uh, Cajun Mardi Gras. Uh, so, back to my current practice. And this is an image of a series I began early uh, last year around this time. And it's the GMO series that I'm making. So I began, I, I collected all these books, and without really realizing, I collected a lot of books with flora and fauna. And some of them are Canadian, but they're all from used bookstores in Saskatoon. So it's kind of interesting to see what people have collected over the years here. A lot of them are kind of tropical and more exotic books, which I found interesting as well. So I began cutting just individual pieces of plant life and putting them together into these kind of three-dimensional collages. And these are all smaller works because as soon as I started folding the, the book pages, the pieces kind of shrink. So like that guy is about eight inches by four inches. And I start thinking of these, these I, I call them creatures that I'm making. Maybe I'm crazy, but I see there's eyes and a mouth and kind of like fins and tail there. Um, so to me, there are these transgenic organisms that I'm constructing out of multiple kinds of uh, species. So this is a, a photo from an installation shot, because once I, I've made about maybe 20 of these, and this was from an installation last fall in the Snell Grove. <coughs> and when, when I present the work, I hang these pieces in a series. Uh, so they're called my GMO vial, or GMO <laughs> um, So. That's another close-up. This was the same, I don't know if you recognize, that's the same one. And you'll see this one and this one again later on. So the pieces hang together from delicate threads from the ceiling. And uh, that allows them to really shift and move in the air currents, which helps animate them further and kind of take them further in uh, an expression of being creature-like or almost being real. Uh, so another part of once they're hanging, what a big part of it is the shadows, um, which fall on the wall or on the floor. And these, these kind of take their mutations further because as the sculptures shift and move, the shadows really shift and change and they can they can also take them to another level in your imagination of being some kind of creatures. Uh, so all this kind of relates to my understanding of, of the GMO industry, and which I, I still think it's pretty shadowy and mysterious, and we don't fully know what impact the GMOs are going to have on us or our environment. So, like this work, that kind of this is a playful response to that, um, and I, I don't I don't get too far into the science myself with my research, but this is just my response to to something that I feel is really around us everywhere nowadays. Like you can't really go into the grocery store without seeing organic labels versus not. So yeah, these are my my little sci-fi experiments. So 
Last fall, I also furthered my exploration of these forms by enlarging them. And I, so as I amassed all these individual cutouts, before I would collage them together, I'd go and scan them in case I ever wanted to reproduce these forms. So you recognize this one from an earlier slide. Uh, once I had all the scans, I printed them on a large format inkjet printer on archival paper to make these. And it, it, it was really different because, you know, the paper's a lot stiffer from the little collage used book pages. And I wanted to be able to maybe take their mutations further. So rather than gluing them like I did with my first storms, I attached these with little Velcro pieces, attached all their individual parts together. And these images are from just an installation. Oh, that's a nice close up of that one. And you'll see these pieces, like some of the plant images, there's multiple, so then I can use them. It goes the yellow flower again. I can use them in other figures, which I think also kind of bring them together as a series. Uh, but this, this, these images are from an installation where I was trying out combining my collage forms with other materials. So this is a, a shell of birch bark that I found in the woods near Emma Lake. And like finding these was really interesting because they're they're still kind of full of all the the log, but it's been deteriorated and eaten or whatever that process is that's happening. So you can shake shake out all the sawdust from the birch bark, and it makes a really clean shell. Um, so already that for me like brought associations to thinking about like what's coming out of these shells and paper pulp and just kind of thinking about the cycle that trees take to become paper. Um, so when I combined them with these, it also brought up interesting associations with uh, how this is the real tree, right? But then you get it with these things that are just the simulation of a tree. Uh, so I was also, I, I hung them on this chain together and kind of had them counterbalance to show that connection and that maybe the, the weight of what our paper industry does to our natural landscape. So just to backtrack in my process a little bit, uh, this is a piece that I actually began last summer, and it's called Remains of a Rainbow, which is just actually the title of the photo book that I got these images from. Uh, so it is a book all about the endangered species and plant life and animals on the Hawaiian Islands, and kind of how they've, they've been really negatively affected by colonization and other invasive species coming into their island ecology. So I took all the individual flowers that I'd cut out and I began to hand cut them on the interior, kind of like I did with the map. But for these I more followed patterns that I saw in the plants or patterns that I associated with their, their own form. And then once I amassed a number of these individually cut flowers, I put them all together into a kind of tapestry. And I'm still in the process uh, of working with this piece. But once, once they were hanging, I also felt like there was, uh, like the shadow really evoked a lot of things. And the shadow kind of points to what is maybe missing, but also the precious little bit that remains there. And it's, it's inter always interesting to hear like things that people come up with in the shadows. Like it's kind of like shadow puppetry where you always, you always see something different from someone else. So I'll still be playing with that and kind of figuring out what kind of story the shadows could tell versus what the, the pictures themselves 
relate to the, the viewer. Uh, so this kind of, this brings me to my most recent series of work, which I'm calling the Aquatic Pinup Series. And I, similar to the Remains of the Rainbow work, I'm just working with one book for this series, which happens to be another rainbow book. I guess nature photographers have a thing for rainbows. Um, but it's called Rainbow <coughs> Under the Sea, so it's all aquatic life images. And I began with this work to combine my solid cutout forms with the more delicate interior cut forms. And instead of sculpting them the way I sculpted the GMOs by folding and bending, I just decided to leave these, these papers flat and collage them that way. But it's important to me that they still have like a three-dimensional element. So I'm, right now they're just they're on these metal rods in my studio to give them some distance from the wall, still create some shadows, but I'm working with different substrates to figure out how I can have them stand three-dimensionally on their own in the gallery space. Okay, so with the, the pinup idea, I was just looking at all these like large format, uh, format photo books of nature, and it just seems like all of all these nature books really kind of centralize nature or they and they kind of turn it into this cheap commodity, right? They're just they want to sell the book. And it's not really looking at what the organisms really are. It's more aestheticizing them. Which is similar to our like pornography industry that just aestheticize the body and prints many cheap reproductions of human figures. So these are my my kind of pinup figures where they're a little bit grotesque and a little bit it's supposed to be sensual. So the, the pieces become, they, they're kind of surrealistic, um, but I also think that the images they're sourced from in the original book are really surreal as well because they're not, they're not really showing you how this fish functions in its environment. And they're kind of, it's just showing you the best angle of the fish or the most beautiful angle of whatever you're looking at. Uh, so uh, to me, like even though these are just kind of bizarre collages of what what could be there, they're in a way more real because they're just showing the layers of that ecosystem. So I like to think of finding these books a little bit like exhuming corpses, but it's a lot easier because books aren't as heavy and there's probably fewer um, uh, danger and <laughs> law, law, breaking the law involved. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so I'm kind of a bit like Dr. Frankenstein when I'm like trimming and clipping all these pieces and piecing together new images to give them a new life. So that's all I have for you today, but I also just wanted to mention our other our upcoming MFA talks there. And yeah, thank you all again for joining me. And if you can stick around for a little bit, I'm happy to take questions and we can have more of a discussion. So thank you. Yes. Rachel, um, so uh, the flowers, it would look like the flowers from Hawaii. Yes, yeah. this one. Those are all cut out, those petals, those long lines, those are cut out? Yeah, like all these individual, like where, where we see white um, yes, that's, um, is where I've cut interior. It's incredibly detailed and fine work that you do, and then you're doing little tiny Velcro, you, are you gluing the Velcro on? Those were it? sticky Velcro pieces. Okay. Yeah, and they're surprisingly strong, so. Um, I didn't have to use too many on these. 
I'm just curious how you work with this in your studio without destroying them. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah, there's often like a few pieces that you know get ripped along the way, but it's not enough. Like the paper is surprisingly strong, um, and I use exacto knives so I can really get pretty detailed with it. Now, what kind of do you use rubber cement or what kind of glue do you? Use? Uh, for for the yeah for these pieces, I used uh, book archival book glue. Oh. Yeah. Yes, Alan. Tough question for you. Okay. Um, it, it's interesting, and uh, by the way, you did, a, you did a great job. Um, a, a really interesting talk, really interesting work. Looking at the body of work, it, it, one of the things that really strikes me is the map piece, and just for people who haven't seen that piece before, um, the map piece also had another life where it was just hanging and all of the little cut pieces were kind of on the floor in a cup. I, I, a question ar arises for me looking at it with the projections on it, that it, it, it loses some of its, in my opinion, kind of some of its delicateness and some of that ability to be able to kind of see it as um, you know, a kind of map and location. And I know you can go behind and you can see that, but even sort of the color of, you know, the, the, the oddity of, of the way that there's that sort of palette that maps are made of, um, a lot of that gets lost. And certainly other things occur, but I'm wondering why you chose to give it this kind of new light with projections and you're, you're losing some of the, I think really subtle, softer elements when it just hangs on its own. Yeah, no, those are good, good points. Um, I guess the simple answer was that I did the production for a class project. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I think I need to, like, I want to revisit that work and and make more of a series with maps as well because I, I did enjoy that process and, and the outcome, like I, I, I like my map. Um, but yeah, I think I need to think more about that, about combining and whether the projection is really important to this piece. I think they're both interesting, incidentally. It, um, it, this becomes just, it, it, if there's something about it where it loses its materiality and takes on a very different life, that's all. Yeah. I think what it does emphasize is the shadow, um, and it, it does to a certain degree through that subversion of the material also makes us aware of the material because it is casting such a dark shadow which is so solid and and sculptural as well so I think I I, I totally I, I really agree with you and um, but I also feel like those little pieces in the cup and we've talked about those before are do you have any um, have you given any thought to including the off cuts or more of a um, demonstration of the process yeah so for, I mean I didn't include that so I they were talking about, I keep, every time I do these interior cuts, and same with the flowers, I keep all my little pieces. Um, so I do have, I have like all the little collection of, of, uh, of the, the land that came from, out from between the roads. So yeah, I think in revisiting the map projects, I do, I do want to think about how to incorporate those. And same with um, the flower pieces, like I think, yeah, they're an interesting part of the work as well. Rachel, I remember at one point you were saying that um, you were thinking of doing some cuttings at, with a Saskatchewan map. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't remember if you actually did that or not, but it seems to me that in the way that you uh, located us within your, um, let's say, childhood geography, um, that you're creating a sense of influences and the way the place and maybe cultural and social geography uh, inform you or resonate in some way, whether it's memory, uh, but that you become very aware with uh, aware of your your current environment. And so here we've got you know Europe, which I assume you have some relationship to. We all do. But it's kind of more incidental uh, in terms of some of the things that you seem interested in. 
So I'm just wondering if you are going to be doing something that is mm, an engagement with some of the, the place that you now occupy. Yeah, so I do have a Saskatchewan map that I started cutting. Um, but I think the trick would be finding like a more high quality map because it's just a road map. And similar, I have one of Louisiana that I started with. And they don't have the nice like white back to them, and they have all these advertisements <laughs> along the sides, which is kind of interesting as well. But and then the other funny thing, I mean, you all know like Saskatchewan's a grid, <laughs> so. <laughs> so <laughs> and then there's the whole like it's. I mean, it helped me get to know the province a little better because then seeing the map, it's like wow, there's two thirds of the province that doesn't even have any roads, apparently. <laughs> so. So yeah, it's very different uh, from this map. Gabriella? I would like to know, uh, why did you choose to, to cut around the roads? Was it just, uh, you know, because of the form or kind of a starting point? Or, or, um, or and, whatever, um, has a specific meaning in the work? Well, I guess like the real starting point for me, um, like I, I didn't have a car when I moved here and I was doing a lot more walking in Saskatoon. I find like a really walkable city, at least the center, compared to where I come from. And I've been, I've mainly like lived in, like people say it's car culture here as well, but to me it was more of a walking place. So I started um, just thinking more about how much time people do spend in cars and uh, yeah, that was the starting point, and how, how, how people need to get out of the cars and see what's in between them. Yeah. So, uh, my question still points uh, to the question of John about the map of discussion, although, yes, they're like, like if, if you go with the limits of the province, everything's in green and so on, you know, which can be interesting, but there's also probably some other layers and geography that you may trace that are not so visible, and you can, I don't know, I wonder if you have thought about that. Yeah, no, I, I hadn't really thought about much more about um, what other parts and maps that I could cut and get into, but it's a good good point. Or, or, or taking off on your thing, Gabriella, just and, and you as well. You're talking about your walks and exploring the city, but even where you go, you know that map, you know those that those traces and trails that you have explored and. Maybe, maybe that could be just, doesn't have to be all of Saskatchewan, but it could be Saskatoon in the areas that you explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a very different map from mm -hmm. the linear, linear yeah. kind of grid and <laughs> road map. Yeah, Eve? I really like that you reuse uh, materials in your, your works. Um, I'm just wondering, does your relationship change to the pieces that you printed on fancy archival paper whilst trying to still mm -hmm. do the same thing? And oh, totally, how yeah. does that work in your frame? Yeah, so I made these three just to kind of, just to do it and get a feel for how it would be to make these larger. Um, but I'm really, I find like, I'm much more drawn to the used books and I think it's interesting that they also have a history, you know, like this is very like new paper and this is the only life it's had, but I like that the, the used materials have a kind of previous life and you can really like feel that when you're working with the materials as well. Um, so yeah, I haven't, you know, I haven't fully committed to like enlarging these yet. This was more of just like an experimental part of it. Just a comment though, I do, what I found exciting about enlarging like that is getting away, uh, further and further away from the actual source. So it sort of, in my mind, relates to GMO mm -hmm. and the inter those kinds of interventions, which, you know, can be a little more scary in some ways and, and takes it, it removes us that you know, many times over sometimes, the bigger and bigger we get. Yeah, they definitely have a like, more threatening kind of mm -hmm. presence when they're larger. Yes. I have more a comment than a question, and it's good you're on these pictures, because it occurred to me when I saw these, because when we talked about these in your studio, people had some concern about the chain and sort of the relationship of the birch bark to the object. But I'm actually, it might just be my current 
blends. I'm enjoying them as photographs. Like mm -hmm. I, I think they work better material material combinations are interesting in a flat photograph mm -hmm. that sort of flattens them. So there might be some potential, like these I thought it, and then the other ones with the birch bark in particular, mm -hmm. I thought they work in a way that's quite like that, you know, quite interesting as a photograph mm -hmm. more than as an object in the space. And mostly I like your, the dimensionality of your pieces, mm -hmm. but I thought these, there's something kind of curious and almost like a fashion picture, but there's this odd birch bark thing in there. And <laughs> the chain looks a bit more necklace-like maybe than so heavy, like it does in actuality. So I'm just putting it out there, something to think about. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's different too, like these, when I photograph them, I like hung them on the wall rather than having them hanging in the middle of the studio, which maybe changed. Uh, and they're very white, like something I'm enjoying about the white space behind them. It's like a book page, right? It's yeah, kind of taking it back to the book. Mm -hmm. I think we have one of the people who works in the works and John von Kubert, a photographer from the movies, that is botanical. It's very good. It's very good to see all the botanical um, uh, photographs of the species that he recreated through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. That's a good thing. Yes, I don't know if I, I really have a question formulated here, so maybe sort of in between question and comment, but it still it strikes me that uh, the way you talk about this work, uh, much of it is uh, with a kind of a, 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 a critical lens on GMOs, etc., and the kinds of hybrid things we're able to sort of technologically create now. And that that's certainly an ongoing sort of reference in your work, although, you know, then you say that you sort of pull back a little bit and you say, well, you know, I'm not really going to get into the science of, of it. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, I, I think of, of uh, bio artists, for example, who are, you know, actually going into labs and, you know, making pink rabbits, et cetera, <laughs> right? Like Eduardo Pack and, um, and, and those people are, are, are doing things, I think they're playing with, with aesthetics, the idea of beauty to uh, give us involuntary reactions like that. In, in, in fact, you called yourself kind of a Frankenstein in, in the studio, right? And so the aesthetics of what you're doing can, I think, very often, give you a kind, make you want to retch and, and vomit, actually, right? If monsters are made, right, it's, it's possible to, you know, give people those, elicit those kinds of involuntary reactions. That's, of course, I don't think at all what you're doing here. And your work seems to be much more kind of a, a celebration of those possibilities, right? It's, yeah. it, it seems like really joyous work. And, and, and beautiful work. There's nothing about this that, that horrifies me or makes me wretch in, in any way at all. And so I'm wondering where that kind of, you're, you're playing with this kind of critical discourse and how that's gonna uh, you know, roll out in, in, in your work as things go on. And maybe it's nothing that you can really comment on at this point, but it, it's something that kind of strikes me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Kaylee. Uh, I think it's interesting how maybe these ones don't have much of a, as much of a rooted in location like your maps are. Mm -hmm. But I can't help but notice how that creature specifically looks like a Mardi Gras mask. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, yeah, I guess like that's what um, part of just showing those uh, slides uh, from the slides of where I come from is about, just because I, I don't feel like I directly think of these things when I'm making work, but I think it all comes, it's all like there, right? So um, when I'm putting something together, it might come from an association that I have to another thing. I see these more in a surrealist kind of vocabulary, not the retching, but the kind of <laughs> bizarre, right? Or yeah. you know, yeah. juxtaposition right. of unusual things, including the birch bark here with the whatever exotic mask face plant thing. Um, so but that's kind of a line I think you're pointing to, Marcus, like, you know, where is it in that vocabulary of the absurd to the repulsive kind of 
I, to me, they're not repulsive at all. And so I think your reference to surrealism, and you mentioned that yourself, is far more appropriate, right? And that these are more like absurdist juxtapositions yeah. that you're making. Well, I don't, and I, I guess, like, I can't, well, I don't think of like GMOs and plant life, like that's not gonna make people rich, right? Because we often, like it's for con consumption, like they're, they're made for consumption a lot of times, or for ornamentation, like if they made those black flowers or black petunia, petunias within brand. So yeah, so I feel like a lot of the scientific research around GMOs isn't something that's really like a repulsed, repulsive, even though like I'm not sure about it, it's not, it's still kind of interesting that, that it's being done and yeah, so I guess I don't know fully where I fall on the critique level. The only reason I brought up the retching thing <laughs> is, is to sort of <laughs> underline the point that aesthetics, I think, can have a political and social dimension, Yeah. right? And because I think most often people write aesthetics off as being very superficial, only about form and composition, but I think actually it runs very deeply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes? I kind of like how you mind your past history and cultural influences and how it was brought out in a positive fashion. And the same thing with political statements about NGOs, for example. But, uh, you make them very positive, and your exploration into three dimensions uh, strikes me as very interesting. So you, you go away from the two dimension and your three dimensionality, and especially when they become live and they move and they project shadows and stuff. It's very positive. I find it very interesting that considering how young you are and you have tapped into so many interesting different things, um, personal and political. And I also like how you manage to make the political negativity into a positive statement, a visual statement. So rather than seeing the, uh, the pukiness of it, I see the opposite, <laughs> the sweetness of it. Thank you. Are there any further comments or questions? And I'm happy to take any too after we disperse. Well, thanks so much again, everybody. Thanks, so thank you.